I'm the kind of person that I, I find interesting stories and it, it sticks with me. You know, you, are you somebody like that where you, you read a story, you hear a story, and it's interesting, and you're like, wow, and I just can never forget it. And I was thinking about it this week. There was this one story of um, some children. They were, they were adults, but their grandparents had passed away, and the last grandparent had passed away. And so they, they had all their stuff, and they were going to take the stuff to, to an auction to auction off all their stuff. So they had a lot of things. Well, they went to take the stuff to the auction, and little did they know, they had something that was in all of Grandma and Grandpa's stuff that was actually really valuable, and they didn't know that. It looked just like a regular vase, and so they didn't, didn't expect anything when they went to the auction, but when the auctioneer saw it and the word got around, next thing you know, people are bidding, and this vase didn't go just for a million dollars, not just five million dollars. Not just $10 million, $85 million for a vase. That vase right there was $85 million. You say, why, Pastor Justin, why would the vase go for that much? Well, they found out that this particular vase was owned by an emperor in China in the 18th century. So it's a very, very priceless, if you will, uh, artifact. But my point bringing this story up is this. Things aren't always as they seem. That's the title of my message tonight. Things aren't always as they seem. Let's say that together. Things aren't always as they seem. And the reason why I bring this up, because there's a problem in our culture today, and it's one word, and the word starts with A, it's assumption. We have a lot of assumption in our culture today. Maybe you've been guilty of it before. But what's assumption? Let me tell you what assumption is. Assumption is this. Assumption is surety without facts. It's when you're so sure of something, but you don't even have the facts to back it up. You haven't done the research to find out if you're actually right. You just are guessing, basically. Assumption is laziness, put it that way. It's the lowest form of communication. And what happens is if you communicate an assumption, you're creating misinformation. Assumption then will lead to gossip and slander. None of you have gossiped before. You see, gossip reveals more about you than it does the person you're talking about. Did you know that? Gossip is the hiding place for unbelief. And ultimately what gossip is when you're gossiping is manipulation. You're trying to manipulate other people by talking by somebody, and usually it's with assumption and facts that you don't have all the facts, you, don't have, you only got like two or three facts, you don't have all the things, but yet you're going to assume and act like you know everything, and you gossip wrongly about somebody. But you see the pattern? Assumption, misinformation, gossip, unbelief. If you c- communicate with assumption and misinformation, You will then gossip, leading to unbelief for you and other people, and ultimately you're going to make bad decisions, and it's going to lead to regret. I don't know about you, but I don't want to to live with regret. Here's the thing. Here's my point. Things aren't always as they seem, and there are many people today who call themselves Christians who do not know Jesus in a personal relationship. See, things aren't always as they seem. Just because you come to church doesn't mean you're a Christian, right? Right? Just like staying in the garage, they'll make you a car. Like there's people today that don't, they know enough about Jesus. They've come to some church services. They've been in church before. They know, they know some things about Jesus, but they don't know him in a relationship. They know some things about the cross. They know some things about Easter, but they don't know Jesus in a relationship. See, there's, things aren't always as they seem. There's an enemy, I hope you know. We're at spiritual war right now. And the enemy, the Bible tells us, prowls around like a lion. But things ain't always as they seem, though. He's like a lion. He's not a lion. Like we follow Jesus, who is the lion of the tribe of Judah, who holds victory, our victory. Amen? But tonight what I want to do is I want to challenge you to think a little bit differently because sometimes things aren't always as they seem. 
So many of you have been here before. You've been in church your life. You've, you know Good Friday. You know the story of Good Friday, Jesus going to the cross. But I just want to challenge you that maybe, just maybe, things aren't always as they seem. Maybe there's some stuff below the surface that you haven't seen. I almost want to bring it up tonight. Can we do that tonight? I got four things. You ready for this? Number one, sometimes what looks like betrayal is the best case scenario. Sometimes what looks like a betrayal is the best case scenario. Matthew chapter 26, 45 and 46. Then he came to the disciples and he said, Jesus is, this is Jesus in the garden, go ahead and sleep. He's talking to the disciples. Go ahead, sleep. Have your rest. But look, uh-oh, the time has come. The Son of Man is being betrayed. This is Judas coming into the hands of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. And if you know the story, Judas goes up to Jesus and kisses him to let the soldiers know, this is Jesus. He is the one I'm betraying. He is the one you need to arrest. He is the one you're after. What is betrayal? Let me define it for you. Betrayal is this, a violation of a person's trust. That's what betrayal is. Let me give you a newsflash. Betrayal is inevitable in this life. You will be betrayed. You probably can go ahead and say today, I have been betrayed, amen? How do I know that? Look, just look at the Bible. Page after page of betrayals that have happened. Samson was betrayed. David was betrayed. Joseph was betrayed. Sarah was betrayed. Paul was betrayed. Jacob, Esau, Jesus was betrayed. You are going to be betrayed. You know about betrayal? I guarantee you there's some of you in here that someone has lied to you to your face, right? Some of you in here, you've had somebody who you trusted with a secret went and told your secret. Yeah? Somebody in here, you thought when you said, I do, that it meant forever, and they betrayed you. Some of you have had somebody who used you to get something. They didn't really want a relationship with you. They just wanted your resource and your power and your position. Some of you have been betrayed by somebody who you thought was your best friend. Some of you have been betrayed by somebody who you thought was in your inner circle. Some of you have been betrayed by somebody who you thought was your family. You've been betrayed. Let me ask you this question. When was the last time you were betrayed? I guarantee you it's popping in your mind right now. That's how I can prove to you that betrayal is inevitable. And it doesn't matter how much church attendance you have, how many devotions that you read, and how many worship songs that you've memorized and sing every single morning. You are going to get betrayed. But here's the thing about betrayal. It leaves you wounded. And what the scary thing about betrayal is is sometimes you'll forget about it and you don't really hurt, but you are not healed. And this is one of the enemy's favorite tools against the believers is to use betrayal, you think you're healed, but you're not. And what happens is when you're, you're not healed, you'll do some things that will divide the church because you're wounded. Why is that? Because when you're betrayed, it affects your discernment. Let me prove it to you. When you've been betrayed, inevitably what will happen is you'll question everybody else's motive, won't you? So the next time somebody else wants to try to help you out or you want to share a secret, you might go, mm, I don't know about that. And what happens if, if, if you give in to that and you don't trust other people, you're, you're going to live a life that's offended, number one. You're going to get angry. And if you don't trust other people, you're not going to be able to do what God's called you to do. You're going to miss the direction and the assignment that God has for your life because you have this betrayal that has hurt your heart and you're not healed yet. So the question's got to be, why do people betray other people? Why do they do that? The reason why you and I betray people is because we're not content with where we're at. That's why you betray. You're not happy with your situation. You're not happy with your job. You're not happy with your spouse. You're not happy with whatever it is that you're not happy with. You're not happy, you're not content. So you give in to greed. You give in to self-ambition, which is idolatry. And idolatry blinds you to the warning signs of the Holy Spirit to say, you are still wounded. 
and you're not healed yet. Jesus warned them on Thursday night, did he not? He said, listen, woe to the one who betrays me. It would be better if he wasn't even born. Now you'd be like, okay, Pastor Justin, back up. You said on this point that sometimes betrayal is the best case scenario. How in the world, after you just described betrayal, how could that be the best case scenario? Good question. I'm glad you asked that because if you didn't, I was going to answer it anyways. But anyway, let me give you two reasons why betrayal sometimes can be the best case scenario. Number one, sometimes betrayal is the only way to know if somebody really loves you or doesn't love you. Every one of us is given opportunities in this life, in all of your relationships, to stay loyal or betray somebody. And when that opportunity presents itself to you in every one of your relationships, the truth will come out based on how you respond, if you're loyal or you're not. The second way, the reason why this can be the best case scenario sometimes when we have betrayal in this scenario with Jesus is because if you read Zechariah chapter 11, verse 11 through 12, it's a prophecy that this is going to happen to Jesus. He is going to be betrayed. He has it down to the exact cent how much they're going to pay Judas to betray Jesus. So Jesus already knew this was going to happen. And so therefore, it's the best case scenario. Because Jesus came, he said, to save which was lost, but to fulfill the prophecies in the scriptures. So as bad as the betrayal was and what Judas, Judas did to Jesus, God used it for good to fulfill the scriptures, to show you and I and everybody through the, the rest of history until Jesus comes back that he is the Messiah. Let me say this to somebody today. No matter the source of your betrayal, God is still your source. If you've been hurt by somebody, no matter who the source of it was, God can still be your source if you will trust him. And if you trust him, no matter what somebody else says, it's not over yet. God is not done with you yet. So yes, sometimes betrayal can be the best case scenario. Number two, the second thing we see in this story, sometimes what looks like a detainment is really a declaration. Sometimes what looks like detainment is really a declaration. Matthew chapter 26, verse 62 and 64. Now, what's happening here is Jesus now is going to be on trial with Caiaphas. The religious people have him on trial, and they're trying to come up with a lie to get him killed. That's what they want. They want Jesus dead. So verse 62, we pick it up. Jesus isn't speaking. And the, then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, well, aren't you going to answer these charges? What do you have to say for yourself? But Jesus remained silent. Then the high priest said to him, I demand in the name of the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God. Now here comes the declaration. He's detained, but watch his declaration. Jesus replied, you have said it. And in the future, you will see the Son of Man seated in the place of power at God's right hand, coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus is declaring, I am he, in the Gospel of John, records it as Jesus saying, I am he, I am God, I am the Messiah. And every person in that room, all those Pharisees and religious people would have known the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, and known that Jesus was quoting Exodus. When Moses said to God, who should I tell them you are? What name should I give you? He says, I am that I am. You tell them that. You tell them, I am sent you. And they said, Jesus, are you the Christ? And he said, I am. Jesus is making a declaration. So the detainment was an opportunity for the declaration. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever been in a detainment season? What feels like a detainment season? Have you ever been there before? Where you've been under restraint where you've felt like you've been imprisoned, where you feel like you've been held down, where you feel like you've been stuck, have you ever been there before? How do you get that way? How do we get in seasons where we feel like we're stuck, when we feel like there's no way out? How do we get there? Well, usually it's because of one or two reasons. Number one, yourself. You. 
your bad choices, your sin, your bad decisions. For example, unforgiveness. When you decide to be unforgiving, greed. When you decide to be greedy, greedy, jealousy, coveting what other people have. You make bad decisions. And let me just remind you, there are consequences every time you make a decision, good or bad. So sometimes we get in a pit, we get stuck, we get in what we would maybe label a detainment season because of our own self. But things aren't always as they seem because sometimes God will keep you in a season. Do you know that? Sometimes God will put you in a season. You want to know why? Because he's trying to work in you and through you. And when God's trying to work in you and through you in a season, it's because he's trying to increase your dependability on him. Sometimes we get a little pride, right? God, well, I got this figured out. I'm, I, I got life figured out. Everything's going pretty good. And we get frustrated. We try to fix things. And we don't look to the one with all the answers. His name is Jesus. And so God will sometimes keep us in a season because he wants you to depend on him more, to increase your trust in him, to rely on him, to believe in his power. And sometimes the only time you can hear him is when you're in lack. So what happens when God puts us in this season? How do I get out of it? Well, it requires your confession and repentance is what it requires. Do you repent of your pride? See, God will keep you in a season to teach you dependability and will keep you there until he sees correction. You know that? He does that through testing. Do you really trust him? Do you, are you really dependent on him? And until he sees correction... He'll keep you in that season. The proof of correction is transformation. Do you know that? How do you know you've had a, your, your course corrected? Transform, transformation, which is in your heart. Your heart is changed. How do I know that? How do I know if my heart's changed? You're able to make a declaration in front of anybody that he is my God. And I don't care what you think about me. I put all my trust in him. I walk away from anything of this world and I put all my dependability in him. He is my provider. He is my Jehovah Jireh. He is my everything. So sometimes what feels like a detainment season that you might be in is actually a season for you to be more dependent on God and declare that he is your provider. The third thing is this. Sometimes what looks like a sacrifice is really love. Sometimes what looks like sacrifice is really love. And in Matthew 26, as we keep the story going on, 65 through 75, we find that after Jesus makes that declaration that I am he, they spit in his face, they slap him, they punch him, they mock him, and Peter denies Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times. We flip over to Matthew chapter 27. Jesus is on trial again, but now he's in trial in front of Pilate. And Pilate's questioning him, and Pilate says, I find no guilt in him, but all the people still do. And they yell out, crucify him! Crucify him! And he says, no, well, I, could, I could release somebody, I could release Jesus, or I can release this thug over here named Barabbas. Like, which one do you want? Barabbas! Give us Barabbas. Crucify him, is what they say. In Matthew 27, 26. So Pilate releases Barabbas to them. He orders Jesus flogged with a lead-tipped whip, then turned him over to the Roman soldiers to be crucified. What is flogging? You need to understand what flogging is. Excruciating pain. Do you know that's where they came up with that word? That's where we get the root of that word because of what Jesus went through excruciating. Flogging would be a beating like you've never seen before. They would usually use a whip. They would usually have nine, uh, nine arms to the whip and would have hooks at the, at the end of it. And they would, like, they would put someone to a post and, and tie them up on a post like this. And they would whip them. And as those, those hooks would get into their back and wrap around their rib cage, and they would yank. So it would hurt to get whipped by it, but then they would yank hard and rip the flesh off of them. Sometimes even taking bones out of the body. And, and again, if you study history, a lot of people didn't even survive that. They would die because of blood loss 
and damage to their organs. So Jesus was flogged, beaten, slapped, spit on. Most historians believe he was hit so many different times at different places before he even got flogged. His eyes were probably all puffed up, probably couldn't see very well. He's get, he, got, he gets flogged, probably could see the insides, but the flesh is gone. Then they take him to a cross and crucifixion. What would happen is they would take these huge stakes and they would, try to, they would put it in your wrist. And if you, if you know anything about your wrist, it's the most sensitive nerve endings right there. And they would, they would drive these stakes into their wrist and through their legs. And most of the time, what they would do is they'd hang them really low. I know we see pictures of him hanging high. A lot of times they'd hang them low because they wanted people to be able to yell at them and make fun of them and throw stuff at them while they're dying on the cross. It was a very disgraceful way to die. The worst, a long and painful death that you would die of suffocation, ultimately. And he would try to push themselves back up, and they'd be so tired that finally they wouldn't be able to push themselves back up to get one breath, and they would suffocate. He did that for you. So my question is, what is sacrifice? What is real sacrifice? Real sacrifice is love, is love. John 15, 13, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. That's sacrifice. That's real sacrifice. It's called love. He sacrificed his life so that you and I could have eternal life. Why? Because of love. Let me say it to you this way. It is not a sacrifice for me to love my wife. It's not. It's not a sacrifice for me to provide for my wife. It's not a sacrifice for me to take care of my children and to provide for them. It's not a sacrifice for me. Why? Because I love them, right? But you know, you can sacrifice selfishly, right, to get some kind of personal gain out of it, right? But see, if it's love, I mean, it is on the book's sacrifice, but really it's love. It's different. Jesus was the sacrifice on the books that you and I needed, but he did it out of love because he loves you. Love overcomes personal needs and wants. It's called agape love. It's love that doesn't need reciprocation. That's how much he loves you. He went to the cross and doesn't even need you to pay him back for what he did for you on the cross. And this is why we celebrate communion, and we just did it. We remember what he did on the cross. We remember the love. Yes, the sacrifice, but the love. Don't forget the love. Yes, he was beaten and bruised, and we we remember that, and it pains us, but remember that he did it out of love, out of love. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he what? Gave. What is gave? He sacrificed his son. He so loved that he sacrificed. You see that? In the middle of this sacrifice, God is showing you, yeah, I gave you my son. I sacrificed him for you because I love you so that you can have eternal life. That's why I gave him. It was out of my great love for you. And for us, I know it's very hard to understand that kind of love, a love that doesn't need reciprocation because we live in a culture today that if you don't reciprocate it back to me, canceled. Right? Canceled. He so loved the world that he sacrificed his son. You see, things aren't always as they seem. Now that you know that God's sacrifice of his son was driven by love, when you read Isaiah 53, you'll read it differently next time. He was pierced, he was crushed, he was beaten. He was whipped because of love. Things aren't always as they seem. And the last thing is this. Sometimes what looks like a burial is really a planting. This is when we get excited. Matthew 27, 58 through 61. 
This man went to Pilate and he asked for the body of Jesus. Then Pilate commanded the body to be given to him. When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and he laid it in his new tomb, which he had hewn out of rock. And he wrote a large stone against the door of the tomb and departed. And Mary Magdalene was there and the other Mary sitting opposite of the tomb. Things aren't always as they seem. And sometimes what looks like a burial is actually a planting. So was he buried? Yeah, he was. He was buried. But he's actually planted. Did you know that a burial and a planting really don't look that much different, do they? You're putting something in the ground both ways. But when you put a seed in the ground, a seed planted is purpose concealed. Do you know that? A seed planted is purpose concealed. Breakthrough is purpose revealed. Come on, somebody. I gotta have a better amen than that. Come on in here. A seed planted is purpose concealed, but when the breakthrough comes, that's the purpose revealed. Right? Yeah, he was buried, but he was planted. Why? Because there's purpose concealed in that tomb. But when he defeated death, hell, and the grave, the purpose was revealed, right? What was the purpose? To give you life because he loves you, because he is God, right? That's who he is. There's more than just what you see on the surface. Listen, everybody who plants, plants with the intention of breakthrough. Did you know that? We got some farmers in here. Can I get an amen from a farmer? You plant with the intention for the seed to break through, right? And God plants inside of you purpose that nobody can take out of you, but you have to access it. Ask a, ask a farmer, ask a farmer in here about planting. Ask him about harvesting. There's a process to planting and harvesting. There's a reaping and sowing that has to happen and you have to have patience, but you gotta have provision from God. Did you know that? For your purpose to come out of you, that seed that's inside of you, you gotta be ready, you gotta be patient, you gotta be ready to move, but God brings the provision to bring the purpose out, to bring the breakthrough. Let's talk about plants first. Let's talk about plants, I'm getting ahead of myself. If you put a seed in the ground, if you're a farmer, you correct me after this, I'm being real basic here, I'm not a farmer. But there's five things you gotta have. Number one, you gotta have water, right? Right? Am I right? You gotta have water. Water ain't cheap. Amen. Come on, somebody. Ready? <laughs> Lord, bring the rain. Number two, you gotta have light. Yeah. Seed needs light. Yep. Number three, it's gotta have some air. You can't suffocate that seed. It needs some air. What about four? You need some space. It needs some room to grow. Right? What about number five? It needs nutrients, right? To grow. That's what that's what a plant needs, right? So guess what? You got some things that you need too for the seed that God has planted inside of you to come and break through so you can see the purpose be revealed, not just concealed, but to be revealed. There's five things you need too. You need some water. You need the living water. Jesus said, listen, I got some water, some living water, that if you taste this water, you won't even thirst anymore. Not anymore. No, it's a different kind of water, right? But if you come to this well, you're gonna wanna thirst again, but you come here to this well, my well, I have living water. And I bring purpose with my living water. Number two, you need some light? Well, you need the light of the world. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. So you might feel like you're in darkness. And there's only one way out of the darkness is to run to the light of the world so he can illuminate anything that's happening in your life that is pulling you back. It's the light of the world. You need some air? Oh, he's got some air. It's called the Holy Spirit. You need the Holy Spirit living and dwelling inside of you, guiding you and directing you. It's the breath inside. It's his breath in our lungs. And that breath is the Holy Spirit breathing life inside of you. It's the, it's the lifeline of the believer is the Holy Spirit. It's God's Spirit living inside of you. Oh. You need some space? You're going to need some space. 
You're going to need some space. Well, guess what? When you follow Jesus, he increases and expands your capacity. When you by yourself, you're very limited. But you follow Jesus, he is unlimited. He can take your capacity and make it like this, and then make it like this, and then make it like this, and then make it like this. Why? So you can reach more people for Jesus. We're not trying to build our kingdom. We are building his kingdom. So he will increase your territory to build his kingdom, not your kingdom. And he'll show you, he'll show you your purpose as he increases your capacity. There's more purpose and more purpose. If he tried to show you all the purpose he has for you right now, it'd blow your mind away. You wouldn't be, you wouldn't be able to handle it. So he increases your capacity one step at a time, one step of faith as because he wants to grow you. Amen. Right? On well, the fifth thing, you need nutrients, right? Man shall not live on bread alone. Daily bread. You got to have the daily bread. Man won't live on, you can't live on bread alone. You can't. You can't. You can go all the fast food restaurants you want. You can eat your favorite one, Jay's or whatever you want to go. You can eat at that thing every single day, all you want. You cannot live on that alone. It's the word of God. That's what is missing in your life. And if you read Ephesians chapter 6, the word of God is a weapon against the spiritual warfare that's coming for you. Every day, you're in a spiritual war, and you need your daily bread every single day. Even a Jay's chicken sandwich with the special sauce is not enough. It's not enough. You need the word of God. If you're not in the word, you are not getting the nutrients you need for your breakthrough. Some of you are a seed in the ground, purpose concealed, because you won't get in the word of God. You won't get in there. If you'll get in there, he'll talk to you and guide you and direct you and show you exactly what to do. The word of God is alive. It's not dead. It's just not some other book. It's living and breathing. You need the word. Did you know? Oh, I got one more thing. I'm I'm not done yet. I'm not done yet. I ain't done yet. God plants purpose and plans in us. That is true. But also, you got to realize he's planted provision around you to fulfill the purpose he has for you. Did you know that? He has planted purpose provision for you right now that's ready to harvest for you to do what God has called you to do. Let me just give you a couple of them. Number one, seeds of access to the right relationships. God has seeds of access to relationships that you need to do do exactly what God's called you to do because you can't do it by yourself. You need divine appointments. You need divine relationships. You need God to line people up. You know, God's called me to go over there. How am I going to get from over there? Well, God's planted seeds for you to run into that person at Walmart or run over or to nudge you to pick the phone up and call that person, right? He has planted seeds for you to harvest right now for the right relationships in your life. Some of you in here today, one of the reasons why your purpose has not come through, why you're still concealing that purpose, is there's people in your life you need to <laughs> cut out. You need to cut out the poison that's around your seed and get it out. And God will provide you with the right relationships. He has given the provision for you. There are people out there he has planned for you to have relationship with. Y'all, listen, I've been there. I have been there. I remember when I was on the, right on the, on the edge of following Jesus, I was right there. It was everything else was business for me. And church was just like just something I just kind of went to. But I was like, no, Lord's calling me for more of that. I got right to the edge. And the thing that really caught me up, I'm going to lose all my friends. I'm going I'm to go have me more friends. Because they're going to think I'm crazy. Guess what? They did. They did. They all said, Deuces. See ya. But God provided new relationships, better relationships, healthier relationships, godly relationships. And, play, and I got more friends now than I did back then, and they're all really good, right? That's what God does. He provides for your every single need. And the relationships I have now, these godly relationships, 
help propel me in the purpose that God has for me. Another seed that God will do. He'll give you seeds of battles to take new territory. Oh, there were no, there were no amens on that one. Were, I don't know if I want to battle, Pastor Justin. I don't know about that. No, 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 no. Hey, listen, if you're going to follow Jesus, we're not. Listen, you don't. If you're not a Christian in here, I'm going to give you a little, a little secret. Because you might have seen some people that just come to church and they act like you all the time, right? That's Listen. As a Christian, we are to walk fearlessly into the fire, walk fearlessly into the battle, and not be afraid. God has planted seeds of battles for you to take new ground. Do you know that? Like, there are battles he wants you to go into. Jesus said, y'all, listen, I say this almost every week. Listen, he said, trials are going to come. They're going to come. But he'll make you stronger through them, perseverance through them, and give a testimony after you get through it. There are other people out there ahead of you that if you'll walk in that battle and win that battle, and you will with him, then you'll have a testimony after that. Because somebody else is going to need that testimony to get through the same battle. And that's what the body of Christ is supposed to do. Not everybody sit on the couch and eat potato chips. We have to get up and take new ground. And to, listen, to take ground, there's going to have to be a battle. You don't just sit on the couch and go, well, I guess we're going to, uh, maybe we'll get some new ground. No, you won't. You won't. The enemy, we, the enemy does not want you taking any more ground. Doesn't want us taking any more ground. God is waiting for some soldiers to stand up and say, all right, I'll, whatever battle you Whatever you want me to go through, I'll go. Because I, I know if I'm standing in the fire, there's another one in the fire right next to me, and his name is Jesus. If I brought the battle on myself or the problem on myself or somebody else did, it doesn't matter. God's not going to leave me or forsake me. He'll guide me through it and resource me through it. Give me everything I need. There's some battles. You got to grow. The third thing is this. Oh, get ready. I can't wait to hear all the amens. You ready? God provides us seeds of confrontation to make changes. Confrontation. He, confrontation so you can make changes. I know some of you are all like, no, no. See, I want to conf- confront some people, and they change. That's right. That's right. Lord, give me that seed. Let's go. Come on, somebody. Because I ain't nothing wrong with me. It's wrong. That's what's wrong with them. Like they're the one that's wrong, right? No, no, no. See, God will put put you in these godly relationships if you'll allow Him to cut some people out of your life and add some people into your life. The people that can confront you lovingly, right, and say, "Stop it." Okay, now this might get some of y'all mad, but calm down. Calm down. Calm down. Do not send me an email, okay? This is an important question. Does somebody in your life have your shut up card? Do you have somebody in your life that you said, here's this card, it's my shut up card, and anytime I'm doing something stupid, you can say, shut up. Stop doing that. You're being a dummy. You're messing up your marriage. You're being a bad parent. You're being a bad employee. You're being a bad friend. Do you have somebody in your life like that? Just be honest. Does someone have your shut up card? Or is your pride too high for you to allow anybody to criticize anything that you got going on? I don't want no confrontation. Ain't nothing wrong with me, right? See, that's pride. See, God provides us everything we need for our seed to grow and have breakthrough. Do you see that? Do y'all see that? Everything that you need to grow spiritually, God has provided it for you. You just got to step up and access it. Not only does he give provision those things I just listed, he has the power of the Holy Spirit living inside of you. And when you live a life of thankfulness, the Holy Spirit brings joy into your life. 
And when you live a life where you're able to listen to other people and get some godly advice, you'll gain godly wisdom. The Holy Spirit will speak to you. And when you're going through tough times and you lean into the body of Christ and that, those godly relationships, the Holy Spirit will speak comfort to you. And when you're going through life and you need to be more organized, you need more productivity, you need more order in your life, the Holy Spirit can guide you and direct you into that kind of order that you need to be the most productive person you need to be. And if you're going through life and you're feeling condemned, you're feeling condemnation, the Holy Spirit can speak to you right now. Mercy. Mercy. Do you need joy tonight? I got a word for somebody tonight. God's not done with you. He's just planted you. You're not dead. You're just planted. It's not over. You're just planted. The purpose is concealed, but it's time for breakthrough now. Does anybody need a breakthrough in their life tonight? Does anybody need that? Does anybody believe he can do it tonight? Let me end with this. Let me end with some scripture here. Don't miss this. Matthew 28. So we're going to one more chapter over. Verse 1 and 2. Just two verses here. Early on Sunday morning, as the new day was dawning, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went out to visit the tomb. Suddenly, there was a what? There was an earthquake. Listen, don't miss this. Who they thought was dead was just planted. Who they thought was buried and dead, he was just planted. He was just planted. There was too much purpose in Jesus for them to hold him down. They could have made the biggest rock on the planet and put it. It don't matter what they put there. They can't hold that kind of purpose down. They can't hold that kind of power down. What they thought was dead was just planted. And that same power that rose him from the dead lives and resides inside of you today. And that's why we call it Good Friday. Yeah, it was a bad Friday on the books. Ah, but things aren't always as they seem. What looked like a bad Friday was actually a good Friday. And that's why we call it a good Friday. Because we know it was good. Because we see it different than the world sees it. How can you, what, how can it be a good Friday if the guy you're worshiping was killed that day? <laughs> he was just planted. You just don't understand. He died, yeah. He was just planted though. Things aren't always as they seem, you see. And so, I want to circle back to this and I'll, I'll stop here, I promise. Kind of. I uh, was intrigued by that story about the vase I told you guys earlier. There was one part of the story I, did, I left out on purpose and I want to tell you here at the end. So you might be thinking, how in the world did they uh, know that that was actually a vase from this emperor from the 18th century in China? How in the world did they even know that? Well, they said there was a very unique seal on the bottom of the vase. And they could verify it, that seal. There was no other seal like it. And that's what made that vase different. That's what made that vase have value, was the seal on the bottom of that vase. Can I see that real quick? Can you throw me that? I'll hop down. So this vase, I found this vase here in the church. I just found it in the closet. I'm just telling you straight up. Uh, <laughs> but guess we're not using it, so it must not have a whole lot of value to it. You know what I mean? But some of you walked in here today, and you don't feel like God's using you. You don't feel like you have any value. You feel like you're just an old ordinary vase in the closet. And you have no purpose. There's other vases. God could use other things. Why would he use me? I want you to know the word says, when you put your faith in Jesus, when we're in Christ, 
when we're in Christ, there's a seal that goes on your vase. It changes you forever. And the seal shows us ownership. Did you know that? That seal on that $85 million vase said, oh, they're, this is the owner of this thing. Now it has value. And so when you're in Christ, what used to just be an ordinary vase now becomes priceless in the eyes of God. And if you'll just bring your vase to him, even if it's ordinary in your eyesight, he doesn't see you as ordinary. Anything he puts his seal on has value. More value than you could place on yourself. Whatever value you think, if you come up with a number, if I said, hey, how valuable are you? And you said, well, I'm worth 10 bucks or I'm 50 bucks or $1,000. I don't know what you think you are. God's value on you. You can't come up with a number big enough, put it that way. Why do I know that? Well, that's a real preachy thing to say. He gave his one and only son for you because he loves you. That's how you assign value to something. It's what will you sacrifice for it in exchange for it. Do you see that? I gotta go there. Just like I know how much money I'm gonna spend when I'm going to Jay's. I'm willing to give a certain dollar amount for that. That's how it gets value, right? God was willing to send his son, Jesus, to die for you. That's how valuable you are. And when we're in Christ, he puts a seal on you and says, this one's mine. No one can touch this one. This one's mine. She's mine. He's mine. They are mine. That family is mine. And within you, and within you, and within you, and everyone in here that's in Christ, he has purpose inside of you. It might be concealed, but it needs to be revealed. If you'll lean into him today, you will have breakthrough, and you will see the purpose that God has for you that's greater than anything you can imagine. Because he's our God. So things aren't always as they seem. But you gotta trust in Him.